All right, Tim Kane, emergent gameplay. Hello, YouTube. Welcome back. This is gonna be. There's gonna be a lot of uploads today. A lot of uploads today. Let's jump in. Emergent gameplay. Before he starts, emergent gameplay is one of those things that, as a game designer, we love to talk about because it is an overused term that I don't think a lot of players understand the meaning of, and I think a lot of designers don't understand the meaning of or how to create it. Right. I think emergent gameplay to me, and we'll see what Tim says because he might have a different idea or a different way of describing it, is gameplay that comes from the tools given to the player that is not, not explicitly designed for. This, I think a good example would be the new Zelda game where you had the ability to create things, right? Contraptions. And people were using them to solve puzzles in ways I imagine the developers never knew about. Or to cheese them in ways that they never knew about. Elden Ring has a lot of emergent gameplay because it provides the player with a lot of tools and ways to abuse them. And so there are ways to defeat bosses or um, to create builds that are, are emergent from the tools that are given. Not saying you are one, but it's hard to know from the outside. You're, I agree. Without seeing the context firsthand. That's one of the reasons that I have these streams too. Is they're kind of a portfolio of myself. And if people want to see the way that I act and interact with the community, I think that this is a much better way than just reading my CV or hearing bullshit accounts from companies that I quit because I didn't like how they treated me. Obviously, those are not very good sources for them to be contacting to act to ask how I was uh, behaving and doing my job in their company. Although I doubt future employers are going to stalk your Twitch and hear you complain about other companies. Yeah, I mean... I don't look. I I I don't have anything bad to say about Red Hook Studios. I loved working with them. I was the shithead there. I was not a good employee. I was egotistical. I was junior. I was overconfident. I didn't know what I was doing, and they were more than patient with me, at all points, and I love them for it. They are exceptionally talented. I was the piece of shit. Okay, I learned a lot from that experience. I have nothing bad to say about. Um, uh, far from home still is yeah kind of I have nothing bad to say about far from home because those were some of the most professional kind cooperative individuals I've ever met they are I am trying to create a team that is modeled very closely to what they had which was people who were experts they were smart they were passionate they were very good at managing their egos and the way they worked together was just seamless. It was flawless. It was a great culture at that company. And that is all I can say about the places I worked. I will say this. At every place I worked, I loved my teammates. And any places that I didn't mention, it didn't have to do with the teammates as much as it had to do with management. Gameplay emerges from my ass when I take a dump. Nobody wants to play that game, though. God damn it. Hi everyone, it's me, Tim. Hi Tim. And today I want to talk about emergent gameplay. Yeah. Jeffrey Sherman 609 asks, Recently I've become entranced with emergent gameplay. After a bit of thinking on it, I feel like a fair amount of your games have offered it and I'm curious if it is considered True. when making a game and if it is, how much? And is it style dependent? Uh, CRPG, ARPG, etc. I do think it is relatively style dependent. It has to do with tools, right? So... When you give the player movement and a gun in a game, right? Let's say that you have a game that the player can jump and shoot. Jump, move, and shoot. These are actions that the player has with them. You could say that the gun is a tool. Now, let's say that the gun provides a little bit of... You can use it almost as a third hop, right? Think of like um, Demo Man with... Um, in TF2 or the uh, rocket launcher in TF2, you can use these to rocket launch or to grenade launch, right? These are tools that sometimes the designers know will create opportunities for gameplay, but they can't always anticipate the gameplay. Then you have more like sandboxy type games where like a Dwarf Fortress, RimWorld, where you give players the tools and you know what they're useful for, but most of the time the designers do not know all of the ways that they can Players can cheese the AI, for instance, with the game to win, or utilize them to avoid negative conditions. 
or to to just win the game easily right this is emergent gameplay utilizing the tools given to you as a player in ways that the designer does doesn't intend or at least in scenarios that the player or, or that the designer didn't anticipate right like using demo man to launch yourself across the map in tf2 and then shield charge into um into some enemies like it's fun it's funny it's it's great and it's emergent from the way that the levels are constructed i like this question i'm actually surprised i haven't really talked about it um i certainly haven't made it the topic of a video but i mean i'll just start off by saying I love emergent gameplay, and yeah, that's great. obviously why it exists in all of my it's very viral. games. It's something I saw happen on tabletop, and it happens just so organically there. <clears throat> that it was something I wanted to make happen in my computer games. Yeah. Now, we should probably define it. So emergent gameplay is when there are things a player can do that arise from the mechanics, but weren't necessarily part of those mechanics or were planned for by the designers or at least explicitly planned for what is tim's best game in your opinion i actually like a lot of his games for different reasons like when he worked at uh for wild on wildstar i mean he wasn't like a lead of wildstar right but i i think wildstar was a very promising mmo that would have been quite uh, it would have been really great to have around today um he talks about what happened there though uh with that game I think South Park Stick of Truth is a really funny and a perfect South Park game. I think a lot of his older games like Arcanum and Temple of Elemental Evil um, are exceptional and cult classics. But Fallout probably, I mean, the way that it's shaped the industry, it has to be Fallout 1. Um, now, when I say that I like emergent gameplay and it was in a lot of my games... I'm not speaking for everybody on those teams. There were a lot of people who did not like emergent gameplay. Emergent gameplay causes a lot of unpredictability for the designers and for narrative it designers does. who have to write story and dialogue and for system uh, mechanics designers who are trying to plan for things that happen so they can set flags and have reaction to it in the game that's really crucial to, to to mention and that kind of goes into something we were talking about either yesterday or the day before where you know we talk about cold and chronicles having all these choices that the player can make right and a lot of that can be emergent to some extent although it is all designed i don't always know when a player is going to or why a player would want to kill a character but i need to design for it and there might be some instances in the game where I just didn't anticipate that a player would do something with the NPC or that they would learn about knowledge from another NPC beforehand just because of the number of choices. And you don't always want to give players unlimited choice and emergent gameplay because it, it isn't a... Emergent gameplay is not a replacement for the gameplay itself. It's not a replacement for a direction that the player needs to move in. Give the player a point A and a point B. And the point A and point B could be finishing a combat, right? Starting combat and finishing combat. And now here are all your tools. Think of Baldur's Gate 3. They gave sausages a damage value. Did they really expect somebody to make a sausage mancer build? Maybe. But they probably didn't plan for it significantly. So, you know, that's a, a bit of emergent gameplay. Or just... Maybe somebody's build is just throwing cooking utensils. That's it. So he's right. Building, you know, building these emergent systems and creating emergent gameplay, gameplay. I can see why some people would hate it and hate working on it because it adds a lot of uh, overhead for development to it. But I like it. I personally like it. And it's one of those things where if you... Build your game around emergent gameplay. It isn't a replacement, and your game your game could still be bad. And it's one of those things when you tell me like Heartbound, right, by Pirate Software, has all these choices that affect the game. I get a little like red flag, right? Yeah, but how do they affect the game? Not all emergent gameplay makes the game better, and not all choices make the game better. So having a lot of choices 
isn't a replacement for good choices. So, you know, that kind of goes the same here. Didn't know he worked on Stick of Truth. That was one of my favorite games. Stick of Truth is so fucking good. It's not perfect. I think the combat is probably one of the worst aspects of it, but it is so, so good. That bit where you kill everyone using the special chest. <laughs> to make emergent systems, you need to overgeneralize game systems. Larian does it a lot. Yes. Yes, and I think that's one of the things that makes... Well, they, they're also okay with people breaking their games, right? Uh, what, what it's a uh, Divinity 1 and 2, especially Divinity 1, was exceptional at this. It was so easy to break the game. So easy. And that's also why it is really, really fun to play. Because you can just do stupid things with it. Especially with, like, arrows. And just break the game entirely. And it's really fun. Letting the player mix up mechanics and do things that weren't planned for mm -hmm. makes all of their jobs much more difficult. Now, I think it's a good kind of difficulty. It's kind of a challenging kind of difficulty that if you do the reactivity based on one of these mechanics, if you, even though you didn't know what the mechanic was, you put enough reactivity in that you catch it, people love it. The reactivity is important too. The, the reactivity is what makes it emergent. If you introduce... The ability to throw sausages in Baldur's Gate 3, but they don't do anything. It's like, okay, it's kind of a funny gimmick. But the fact that there is reactivity to an extent that you can use these in combat, that there's a way to buff the usage of them, you've created reactivity and ways to allow the player to build gameplay around it, or at least optimize and get through content with it, right? Now, I'm not going to talk about any other genre than RPGs, computer RPGs, because I haven't made any of those other games. But I've seen it happen, and I love it in those games too. So let me walk through kind of how I think it happens and how it happened for me and how we handled he didn't it. Help and also some places where I wish they had handled it in other games. So let's talk about Fallout. In Fallout, we had emergent gameplay. Some we expected to happen and others we didn't for example in fallout once we put explosives in and explosives could damage anything in their radius that had health that's when we did things like give doors or locks on doors hit points because we knew that a that meant they could be attacked and anything with an aoe would do damage to them and we knew that people would use explosives to get through doors the nice thing about it was once we did that at the systemic level in code we didn't have to special case it any any door that you could break down you could use an explosive to get through and that was just a good thing the one thing i've mentioned a lot which, which was the emerging gameplay that we did not expect was pickpocketing in pickpocketing and i was the one who, who implemented it i had to get it done quickly. he doesn't currently work at obsidian as far as i know he, he he's now retired but he does some consulting sometimes and I had already done bartering. So that UI already existed, and I thought, I'll be clever, and I'll use the same UI and just put a flag in saying, hey, you're pickpocketing, so there is no... When you say you're done, it doesn't go and check your barter skill to see if the guy accepts it and how much money or whatever, how, what his reaction is to it. Instead, if you're pickpocketing... It just takes it and it rolls to see against your, your skill to see if the person notices. All that was exactly what we thought was going to happen. Yeah. What someone in QA discovered was because it was bartering, I could put things to go into them. I could not just take things. I could put things back. And that's how they figured out that they could put items inside an NPC's inventory. Of course, they started doing it with grenades and explosives and then moving away and watching that NPC blow up. And, you know, that's one of those, that's one of those bugs that, you know, it gets found and you're like, this is amazing. We're not fixing it. When they discovered that, we decided to leave it in. And in fact, I think we ended yeah, up using it, it as a means in later quests to do implanting incriminating evidence. But it was not intended. So that's an example of emergent gameplay that we discovered before it shipped. 
and we loved it. And then we started making use of it. But then other things, of course, people discovered all kinds of things, especially when I watched Speedrunners of Fallout and realized we didn't keep track of whether you ever got a water Oh, yeah, chips. like, it, that's, a, that's a good point. Like, Speedrunners, if there's anybody who's going to figure out emergent gameplay from your games, it is Speedrunners. They will break your game in ways you never expected, utilizing mechanics in ways that you never intended. Um, even, especially for, like, glitchless ones, too. Glitchless Speedruns, I think, are going to be the ones that utilize um, emergent gameplay more than glitch speed runs which will utilize like bugs and uh whatever the other word is i can't think of it um there's another word uh, like manipulating game mechanics but it's not technically a bug it's more like a, some, i don't remember you guys can correct me so people can speed run fallout by just ignoring the whole water chip um quest line and just killing the mutant army and then killing the master and boom game over now, like I said, we knew we'd have emergent gameplay because we were playing a lot of tabletop RPGs mm -hmm. and we watched emergent gameplay happen. We watched people do things with their characters we didn't expect. You know, try to talk to the, the bad guy in the dungeon and have such a good skill and make such good roles that they talk their way out of an encounter. That was cool stuff. I and love that. While it's hard pressed to call it emergent for tabletop, it was unusual that players acted like that. Yeah, I get what he means, but uh, you know, I think we talked about that a couple days ago where I didn't like in RPG games nowadays where a lot of it is just you come across like an encounter of bandits or something or goblins and it's a, it's an encounter, it's an enemy encounter. These are enemies that were placed. And that's your option is to fight them. It it doesn't really make the game that interesting. I think Baldur's Gate 3 does a really good job especially with act 1 of the game in doing this. I think later acts it tends to just kind of It just kind of becomes a standard RPG, right? You have enemies or not. Stalker did it well. Yeah, Stalker does it well too. I, I like the idea that I can... I have multiple ways of solving any situation. And that it isn't just considered an enemy encounter because they don't like me. There might be cases too where it's like, okay, both they, they are enemies. But maybe they don't want to start attacking me. Maybe they're, um, there's only two goblins and there's four party members. They'd probably just run away, and I can choose to attack them. Or maybe they just want to talk the way out, or they try to hide, right? Like, do something like that that's interesting. <laughs> Twerk on the goblins. And when we were talk about making Fallout, and we had this discussion in detail before we even did one line of design for Arcanum, we said, look, We've got to provide a rich enough set of mechanics and they have to be low level mechanics that basically just define if the player does this, this happens. Yep. And if you have enough of those low level ones that interact with each other, emergent gameplay will just happen. Yep. It'll just happen all by itself and you should go he for it. He says mechanics, you know, I, I use the same kind of word, but for like tools here, it's just give the player the tools, give the, the game reactivity to those, to those actions and just let it exist. Let it exist. And, you know, a good example, too, of this is like Deus Ex, right? Or Hitman. Deus Ex and Hitman are excellent examples of emergent gameplay. Of course, there's some design to it, but there's there's so many things that I don't think they anticipated, especially with speedruns, that show just how you can utilize these crazy ideas to break the game. Circuit did simulate AI that is not in game, like it was simulating a group of bandits and a group of mutants, and if their path crossed, they will fight and you can stumble upon it. Yeah. Stalker is a great series. I'm looking forward to Stalker too. I hope it's good. We're going to play it on stream, so I hope it's good. Um, so the way you do that is you make the code very sucks. Yeah, it does. <laughs> general. For example, if you have a lock in a game, you can say this lock is actually part of... When you, when you make a, an object that's lockable, like a container or a door you have to do two things for the lock. You have to say, what's its key ID and how hard is it to pick? Yep. And now you can lock pick that, the skill works, and it knows what penalties or bonuses to apply to the skill. And if you ever find a key with a matching key ID, it opens that, it sets that lock to open as well. 
And then you can go take that key ID and put it anywhere you want. You can put it in a guard's pocket so it can be pickpocketed. You can put it in another container so it can be stolen from there. But if the object it's attached to has hit points and those hit points ever hit zero, we mark that object as now open. And we're done. That, and yeah, now, that's easy. Now it's like, okay, now what what do we want to be able to do to do damage to this? Do we want to uh, make it weapons? Do we want to make it explosives as well? Just you've put it in there. The player knows it has hit points. Don't feel bad. You shouldn't feel bad as a designer that the player is choosing to cheese your locks with explosives. Then just make explosives a little bit harder to obtain. Uh, make them expensive to use. But if a player optimizes their build around it and not lock picking, yeah, go for it. You can now lock pick this thing. And uh, Baldur's Gate, by the way, does this well. Uh, same with um, Divinity. You know, Larian is really good at this. It's like. If you want in, um, what is it, in Baldur's Gate 3, you can just take a two-handed weapon with one of your characters and just just destroy a chest. Fuck lockpicking. Smack, broken in, done. Any Unless they're metal. Game, game that's on something with hit points can be blown open or beaten open yeah, you can't make or whatever games, you yeah. want to do. Now... The flip side of that would be because people go, well, that sounds. How would you ever not do that systemically? Well, imagine if that if you had a particular lock that was scripted, so that if a nearby screwdriver was applied to the lock, it would say, "Oh, you popped the lock." That's a scripted event. Mm -hmm. The only thing that it works on is that lock, and the only thing it works with is that screwdriver. I hate those because it teaches the player something that's not general, something they can't use anywhere else. And it makes them start to go, okay, I see a lock. Let's look around and see if there's something particularly unique about this lock, which isn't what I wanted. I want you to have like, hey. You it it works for some games, but he's right. It doesn't work for like RPGs and such. It, it, it would work more for like adventure games, right? Where you're supposed to be looking for items and combine them, you know, like a LucasArts adventure game or something. A bunch of different tools in your tool chest of actions. One of them will probably open this lock. The other thing I hate is when a game states a general rule and then doesn't follow through. I'm not going to tell you what it is, but a very popular RPG in the 90s did this. I was asked to go find an NPC. When you find them, they're dead. They were killed recently. And the intention was you pick up the body and take it back and go, oh, sorry, here they are. They're dead. But... I was playing a cleric, and even though I wasn't high enough level to raise dead, I had a raised dead scroll. And that scroll said it worked for anyone who'd been dead up to nine days. And I knew this person couldn't have been dead for more than three. I knew it. They were alive and home three days before. But I couldn't raise them from the dead. Yeah, yep. See, and, and that's one of those things where the player is expecting something to work because it says that it should work. And the designers failed to implement that that net into the game right and that's that is going by the way that is going to be cauldron chronicles biggest challenge if we want to have unique reactions to certain effects that are put in potions for npcs like for instance we use the example all the time the assassin comes in asks for a poison potion you give him a health potion and now the person that he's supposed to assassinate uh is in perfect health and the assassin gets caught right that is not a failure because you could give him a potion of, I don't know, uh, paralysis. That's not going to kill the, 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 the person he wants to assassinate or a potion of regenerate stamina. You know, it's like all these different things. We need to have some sort of reaction that makes sense. Or at least in many of these cases, we need to have a reaction that makes sense uh, for the situation. And that is a lot of thinking, it's a lot of organizing, it's a lot of writing. But if we do it well, we'll make a game that has a beautiful amount of reactivity to the player's choices. Remember to re-cork your potions, you don't want to turn the lake into a lake of love potion when you go for a swim. Oopsies. That, ooh, that fish, she's hot. Said the best emergency system in Bolivia was hidden away, Goblin Wars. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah, Tim brings, brings up a good point. Another example, too, with the, like these locks, is what if you give uh, 
what if you give these things fall damage too? So now that, and again, Baldur's Gate 3 does this well, when you throw the chest, it takes fall damage from falling down a height. So one way you can break it, if you can't bust it open, and you don't have a lockpick, and you don't have the key, why don't I just pick it up and go chuck it off a cliff? Simple as that. Again, Baldur's Gate 3 does this beautifully. Beautifully. I love the combat system in Baldur's Gate 3. As much as I have to say bad about Baldur's Gate 3 from a narrative aspect, I think that it is a beautiful blend of uh, D&D 5e and Larian's own unique style of developing games. That's how meth heads break open ATMs. Meth head playthrough of BG3. I'd cast the scroll, click on the dead body, and it would say invalid target. I was angry. Yeah. Because A, it wasted the scroll. I had to reload and Ooh. I lost about 20 minutes of gameplay. But That's annoying. I, was, I, I remember finding myself as a game designer going, why did they give me that scroll? Someone put it in the game. And then why did they make this quest that doesn't even follow the rule of that scroll? I, I thought what was going to happen is I was a racist person. I was going to go back and, the, and you know, the person who sent me on the quest was like, oh my good goodness, you found him. Thank you th so much. Blah, blah, blah. Nope. Well, it was a quest. It was it was a quest designer who wanted to make this linear quest, and if it's like an RPG game, which it kind of sounds like it was, you haven't made this quest into a, something with choices, with something that people expect out of an RPG. Right? Is multiple ways to solve it, multiple endings to different quests, things of that nature. You you haven't done that. I mean, look, it's possible in Colden Chronicles. Maybe the, 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 the king is dying. Maybe he has some sickness, some disease. So instead of giving the assassin poison in order to help kill the king and finish him off, you give the assassin a potion of cure disease. Well, now you've saved the kingdom. Isn't that cool? Like, that's something that you don't have to do. That's something that you, you've learned knowledge of this from maybe another NPC or a lore book or whatever. And now you can utilize that knowledge to solve a, a problem in the world that you only know about because you went down a certain dialogue path you learned that the king is dying of a disease blah 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 blah, blah whatever that is reactivity to it's it's still designed it's not necessarily emergent or if you want to go so far you could say it is designed emergence but it is at least a way to give allow the player give the player the tool set and allow the world to respond to that tool set even if it is in a uh, a designed manner. We don't know which one the player is going to choose. Does he tell the assassin to get away because he doesn't believe in killing anyone? Does he give the assassin some useless potion? Does he give him the poison? Maybe it's not strong enough. Um, does he warn somebody else afterwards that is looking after the king that there was an assassin coming in here and we, he saves the king that way? Who knows? Who knows, right? And we need to be able to account for that. Again, we need deep organization. We're going to need at least one or two exceptional narrative designers who know what they're doing. But if we do it well, I think that the amount of variation in the game will be truly extraordinary and a, a very, very cool to watch players get different endings with different NPCs or with different kingdoms. Nope. There was only one way to solve it, and that was to bring back the dead body and go, they're dead now. Yep. Yep. Did not like that. Perfect example of a place where an emergent behavior could have happened and they flubbed it by just not having a generic response. And that's that's how you cover emergent gameplay that you don't necessarily specifically plan. Well, it's for. not even that much work. It's just like have him be resurrected, sit on the ground and say, you know, have him have some dialogue about how he died or whatever and say, okay, you know, just give me a second. I'm going to rest here. I'll meet you back at the um, the house in a couple days or something. Whatever. Just, it's not difficult to do. But it just requires that forethought. And even if the quest designer wanted, maybe the quest designer didn't know to do it because it hadn't been dictated by the design director that, hey, this is what we want to achieve with our quests. And that's what I need to do as a design director for Colden Chronicles with our quest. I need to say, hey, this is what we intend to do with our quests, with our NPCs. And I think Spoon is halfway there. He's halfway there. But he's there's still a better way that we could write Spoon and have that reactivity from different potions that you give him.
for. What you should do is put in all the code so you know you handle a lot it's of them when you can. Play. Just, you know, the explosives, blow off that lock. Now they can get in. Try to react to as much of the other emergent gameplay as you can. For example, if you just added a generic response to the NPC that sent you out in the quest, and if you come back with that character that you were sent to find alive, the quest giver goes, oh my goodness, you rescued him. I don't know how you did it, but I yep. am indebted to you. Here, have a yeah, reward. He doesn't know that he died. That's all you have to say. Because that's all you know. As the designer, you don't, you're don't. you like, I don't know how this would ever happen, but just in case it does, let's put in a line for it. We did that in several places in Arcanum where we that's that is smart sure. yeah that's smart if you if you have those tools and you're like well i don't see any way that the player could do this but we you also can't predict players and sometimes they will find really weird ways to fuck with your game so yeah adding that in even though you are pretty damn sure the players can't do that is really cool how the player would pull something off but we put in a line to test for it anyway are they back with this person um or you know, or did they come back and now this person's dead somehow? We don't know how it happened. We weren't there. We don't have a, a specific response going. I can't believe you let him stand within that fireball. We just go, oh, he died. I can't believe you let that happen. I don't like you anymore. The other reason you shouldn't like beat yourself up for not planning on every possible way that a player will do something is because you literally can't. If you have a rich enough rule set, yep, you can't plan for everything the players are going to do because players are clever little devils and they will think of things and do things that you would not have thought of if you had spent 10 years planning this game yep somebody and it's because out. it's just a matter of of numbers right it, you know if you have <laughs> you spend one year let's just say or like one week of normal work hours testing your game 40 hours to find ways to break it that does not compare to 10,000 people spending one week trying to break it and you would have to spend 10,000 weeks to even match the amount of time that they did. And that's with one brain. This is 10,000 brains, so right? It's like um like the uh the AI that they they do to what's what's the the deep 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 learning AI, right? For games it's like just iterations, iterations, iterations and learning. What is it? If you're 100% sure this shouldn't happen and it happens, isn't it just a bug? It depends, I guess, on the outcome, right? Where if, if you're sure that it shouldn't happen because it will cause a problem, I guess it's a bug. If you script a way, a response to it, even though you don't know how it would ever occur, but it, the outcome isn't undesirable from the game state, then I guess it's more just, well, I mean, if, if it happens, there will be something for the player to find, but it's not going to ruin the game, right, if they do it. Sounds like weak design if you if you need to, uh, to program for failure. But is it programmed for failure or can you anticipate everything that will happen? It's not a response to bug feels like a money sink, but it isn't a bug. It is, I don't know of any way that the player would get into this level with a explosive. But if they pickpocket the explosive onto this NPC, you know, maybe there's a way that they can, maybe you, you're, you're searched at, uh, before entering a casino, right? And you have all your weapons taken away. But if you kill, if you pull out a weapon in the casino, maybe you have a, a script for it. And you, you don't know of any way the player will get past this. But maybe there is. Maybe there's some way. Maybe there's a weapon that isn't counted like that, but is considered like that. You know, I, that's just an example, kind of a bad one. But it's not a bug you're creating an outcome for it. So you're actually preventing a bug where wherein the player would do something that wasn't, that didn't have a response in the world and you're giving it a response. So in fact, you are fixing a potential bug. You're not causing one. Doesn't sound like well-crafted design. I disagree. No bows, no swords, leave your weapon here. And you bring in a rock and you start hitting somebody with a rock, right? I mean, I mean, really, what if you can do that? 
what if that's an option so it's like you, you were just preventing p potential bugs and non-responsiveness from the world Baldur's Gate 3 had a lot of this problem in especially in act 3 where things you did didn't have responses by your companions or world for instance uh, a good example would be I can find it Baldur's Gate 3 if, if something with with was near Does this include the yeah, it includes the cutscene. Heretics. No, oh, this this doesn't include the cutscene. I need the cutscene with Nier. Four K, I don't need this in four just please load. What do you think, uh, Should we take Nier? Where does he where does he push the, the guy in? You got the stench. If I didn't Spoilers? You haven't played it yet? Jesus Christ. Yeah, yeah, don't watch. Oh, it's it's right here after he gets out. Does not like this happens and your companions are just like standing there. I don't I don't see any of his companions in this, in this dialogue, but usually your companions would be standing back here and your companions have no reactivity. And there was a lot of this in Baldur's Gate 3 where it just doesn't make sense. Like evil, terrible evil thing happens on screen and your lawful good or chaotic good characters would just... Huh, yeah, whatever. Whatever the main character says or does, I'm cool with it. No problem. And I think that's one of the areas that I really enjoyed, or one of the things that I really enjoyed about uh, Pathfinder, Wrath of the Righteous, because I felt like it had more reactivity to that, and your your companions could just leave you if they felt like you weren't holding up to their values. Like, if, if they were chaotic evil and you were chaotic good, even if they could join you, maybe they wouldn't stay with you because you're doing things that are just actively against their values. Um, yeah. So, you know, the reactivity is important. Out. You see it when you look up, you know, you, you get stuck in a game and you look up how people did and you find the most clever solutions of people yes. saying, oh, bring this character and have him go invisible or uh, break down this door and enter through the back or disarm this trap or cast sleep. Or just like and hide behind this one rock and fire at this specific attack. And that way it'll take a long time, but you can do it without taking any damage. They, they do all these things that are perfectly possible within the game, but disable some kind of reaction that you can tell the game designers were planning on. So, what's my wrap-up of all this? Try to do as much code, low-level and generic as you can. Try to react to everything you can. If it's specific, write a specific line. Then write some more general reactions that people have. That they don't know how you did it because you, the game designer, can't imagine how they do that thing, but you throw in a reaction to it anyway. And then relax. Players are going to be clever. Players are going to find ways of doing things that you didn't plan on. Rather than be mad about it and argue about it and fight against it, relax. Let them do it. Let players be smart. It's fun. It's fun to read about it how is. people it really is. met the challenge in your game. And, so and more than it being fun for you to read about, it's fun for the players. Especially if it's a single player game. Just let the let the player break your game. Like who cares? If that's what's fun to them, if 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 cheating is fun, if cheesing your game is fun to them, just let them do it. As long as it, for games there might be some narrative director. Okay, I, I agree to that, but in generally speaking let the players have fun, and if you take away their OP builds, there are cases where it's good to do that, right? Anti-cheese design. Usually, I would only do that if it was too easy. If it was too easy to destroy the intended gameplay of the game by doing something that players might do accidentally. Like, if literally giving... 
Uh, let's just say, for example, giving a health potion to every NPC in Colton Chronicles ensured that they would all stay alive. Like, that's not really an issue with the, the potion making or whatever, but that's an issue with the design, right? We, we didn't add enough diverse stories to be told with our potions. That's not going to happen, but that's just an example. Plan for known unknowns, but it's the unknown unknowns of the problem. Yeah, it's, it's when you don't know, and that's when it's, that's a bug, right? And I think Baldur's Gate 3 had a lot of that, where they had a lot of small reactivity. A lot of it wasn't meaningful, but they had a lot of small reactivity that wasn't there. And, play, like, character responses to things that didn't match up with what was going on, and so it kind of pulls you out of the immersion, right? Especially in Act 3, there was a lot of that. Wouldn't want a narrative game to break flow. Agree. Agree. And that's where Colden Chronicles, it's like if you, if you anticipate that giving this potion or poison to a character will have a certain effect and it doesn't, you will feel very disappointed in the game, right? And uh, I, I agree with that. I would feel really shitty too. Like, the, okay, I have to only do what the designer is wanting me to do, one of these three options, or else the game isn't going to be that great. The point of Colden Chronicles is that you can give any potion to any NPC some of the NPCs might know that you've given them a false potion. Some of them might not. And depending on the effects in that potion, different outcomes might occur. So we might need to refactor the way we, that we handle potions, handle effects, do the dialogue. That's all part of it. This is a game that hasn't really been made before in this level, and it's going to be a, it's going to be a challenge. So anyway, bottom line, Tim likes emergent gameplay. He had food coloring. And thank I kind of like that. That's pretty fun. The question, Jeffrey Sherman. Like trick them. Uh, what? I really like that. That was really fun. That was a good, uh, good talk. Emergent gameplay is always one of those, those topics that designers love to endlessly discuss. Here is the link to the video. I really enjoyed that. You guys might hate me for this, but I'm going to get going soon here. I will end the YouTube recording. Bye-bye, YouTube.